Hi, Nina. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm wonderful. Good. Uh, I can't claim to be that good, but I'm very happy to be with you. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Nina Strominger. You are a professor at Penn. You're a professor both in the um, psychology department and I guess also at the Wharton School. Is that right, Rich? That's right. As Donald Trump, who uh, was at the Wharton School as an undergraduate, has pointed out it is the best business school in the world. Right. So you imagine how smart the students are and the professors there must be even smarter. So. Yeah, because it's the best. Mm-hmm. People are saying it's the best. Um, <laughs> so uh, you've done a lot of interesting work on, for one thing, the idea of the self, you know, how people think of, well, how they think of their self, what it means to have a self, an identity, uh, and how they think of other people's selves, what, how they think of kind of uh, the essence of the identity of people they know. Um, mm-hmm. And you've also done um, work on, uh, that bears on the question of how people uh, of different religious traditions uh, confront the prospect of death, how, how afraid of it they are, um, and the connection between those two subjects is that you have, uh, you've looked into how different, uh, religious philosophies kind of conceive of the self and how different conceptions of the self in different religious traditions might bear on how you confront the prospect of death and how mm-hmm. unsettling you find it. And, and just, um, at the risk of, uh, uh, doing a plot spoiler, you found that somewhat counterintuitively, um, at least the Buddhists you studied um, were more afraid of death than (laughs) the Christians and Hindus you studied. And and you did this work with actually a couple of people I've I've had on this uh, uh, podcast, Jay Garfield uh, and Sean Nichols. They were both collaborators. Those were two two of your three collaborators in the, the fear of death study. Yep. And, and, uh, and Jay Garfield is, is something of an expert in Buddhist philosophy, and Sean Nichols is also a philosopher. So you brought the psychology to this, is that? The- yeah, I was the, you know, I was the methods guru. So I was the one who was yeah. helping, you know, really designing the studies and doing the stats and stuff. Okay. And then, of course, uh, Sean brought in the philosophy and cognitive science. Uh, and Jay, as you point out, is the, the Buddhism scholar. I think, I believe that the project started when uh, Sean was presenting some of our work um, on the moral self and uh, Jay came up and said, well, hold on a second. I mean, that's what it's like for, for Westerners, but you know, in Buddhism, they have a very different conception of the self and would any of this hold in those populations. So that was the genesis. Of was the Jay quite surprised by some of the findings? Very surprised. I mean, we were surprised, but I don't think we were committed to an outcome. Whereas Jay, who's also a practicing Buddhist, uh, was, I mean, maybe uh, more crestfallen, but <laughs> we just thought that it was cool. <laughs> I actually, I, I, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't have predicted the results, but reflecting on them, I'm not sure I find them as surprising as, uh, as some might find them. I mean, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I've, like Jay, I'm a little bit of a practitioner, but much less intensive one than he is, I think. And I wrote, my last book was about Buddhist meditation. And um, so I, I may talk a little about why I wouldn't find it so surprising. And and you, I know in your paper had some, some kind of retrospective uh, conjectural explanations of why uh, for the finding, but why don't we, why don't we start at a more general level and go back to your initial interest in kind of studying the self and people's conceptions of the self and this idea of the moral self that you alluded to. And, um, I, I gathered that uh, kind of an important methodology that you wound up bringing to bear on this grew out of your watching the X Files. Is that? Yeah, that's yeah. That is. <laughs> um, I'm a scientist, Bob. So of course, all of my best ideas come from watching Match, the science, fiction. science fiction. Yeah, I mean, sure. 
Um, but yeah, I, I was watching, uh, just sort of binge watching the X-Files and I noticed that a bunch of the episodes had this, uh, um, uh, I guess plot device where someone's soul or essence would leave their body and go into another body. Um, but I also noticed that it wasn't consistent which traits went over. So some of the traits would port over and then other ones wouldn't. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder if there's any pattern there. Um, so Sean Nichols and I, you know, it's just we started off just with a study where we asked, okay, imagine that someone's soul leaves their body and goes into another body. How likely is it that, you know, the following list of traits, each of them would manifest in the new body? Um, and what we found was um, that the traits that were seen as most likely to port over were related to morality, moral values, behaviors, character traits. Um, and you might think, okay, well, that's just, you know, we're talking about souls. So of course, when you invoke something religious like a soul, you're, you're going to bring over the, the moral or spiritual features of someone. So we ran subsequent studies where we asked about, you know, how different would you be if you took a medicine or if you had a certain type of brain damage? We found the same pattern where people said, well, you're really not yourself to the greatest extent um, when you lose your moral capacities. And that's more than, you know, if you lose your memories, if you lose your non-moral personality traits, if you, if you lose other sort of cognitive capacities, people really see moral features as central to the self. Mm -hmm. So it, the question is kind of, what is the threshold where people are inclined to say, that's just not the person I knew. And more than any other thing, it's changes in the moral character of the person that will lead them to, to say that. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm struggling with whether to, to mention this, but I guess I'll just mention it. Uh, it, it. It bears pointing out that when philosophers and psychologists talk about the self and identity, there's lots of different types. Um, and my work has really just, for the most part, focused on uh, what might be called uh, diachronic identity, so who you are over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's the sort of connecting thread between uh, this, uh, this research we're talking about now and the Buddhism research also has to do with mm -hmm. diachronic identity. Is yeah. you know Nina at time one the same as Nina at time two, and and what are transformations that she could undergo, and she would no longer be the same person versus mm -hmm. changes she could undergo, and she would be completely different. And one thing Buddhist philosophers are inclined to point out is that for all of us, the answer is actually we are very different people at different uh, times in our life. I was just having a conversation with someone you surely know, Paul Bloom, the psychologist at Yale. We were talking about first-person shooter games, you know, video games like mm -hmm. deeply immersive video games. And I have, I, I seem to have no interest in exploring them. And if you had told me, like when I was in my early 20s, describe these games, how immersive they would be and like virtual reality games and said to me, and you will have no interest in exploring them, I would have said, no, I'll have to be dead before I'll have no interest in exploring them. And yet here I am uh -huh. and I have changed that much. I mean, that's a big change, right? And, and, and there's a ton of changes like that. And this is one thing that the Buddhists point out. It, but but the the strong intuition of all of us, pretty much, <laughs> is we are there is continuity of identity. We are fundamentally the same person we were. Right. So you can make a distinction between um, surface changes and this idea of like, well, but maybe there's still a core inside of you that is constant and unchanging. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in a lot of Western religious traditions, as well as, you know, there's work on this with um, young children as well. They're able to make this uh, distinction between uh, um, what something is underneath and how something appears. So, you know, the, they're ca capable of seeing that the caterpillar and the butterfly that it turns into, even though it shares none of the same features, mm -hmm. uh, maybe the same DNA, right? But aside from that, none of the same physical features. And yet we can say that diachronically they are in some way connected. Um, so it's not sufficient just to have, you know, radical change uh, to still uh, be able to say that, you know, uh, something could be the same or different. Right. This can be orthogonal. Right. Maybe I should just, as a little bit of a tangent, but one we could get back to say that another feature of Buddhist philosophy is the idea, leave aside the question of whether I have a self and what it consists of, but, when we perceive essence of uh, other beings and even essence of other things, according to Buddhism, that's kind of an illusion when we even mm 
totally sense that there is an essence and yes. uh, but that's also a strong intuition we all and, and you you mentioned that uh, is it is susan gelman the name of the psychologist yes. who has done such work so much work on, on people's intuitions about about uh, about the essence of uh, other of animals and so on, and, and there is a strong intuition there. Mm -hmm. So, um, so okay, is there before we move to the finding about uh, different religious traditions in fear of death? Do you want to say anything more about maybe, maybe we should get a little more fine grained in looking at what people think of as constituting the the core identity of others, the most essential. Uh, aspect of others i mean moral moral things are at the top mm -hmm. um what are other but, but other things are are more important or less important right yeah so it's it's not simply that some things matter and others don't right that's the wrong way to think about it it's just that some are really important and some are not important at all and then there's a lot of stuff in the middle so um, generally speaking cognitive and mental capacities are seen as more essential to the self than fit the physical uh, parts mm -hmm. of the self. There's a wonderful uh, quote from Dan Dennett, where he says, um, the brain is the only organ of the body where it's better to be the donor than the recipient. Right? So this captures this intuition that if you were to donate your brain to a, bo a body, it, all that would, you're not a donor anymore, right? You are the recipient. The brain moves around with the self. Right. Um, sure, some physical features are seen as con uh, uh, conferring some I identity like properties, but they're, they're really not the essence. It really seems like the mind is stronger. But within the mind, you, there's gradations. Mm -hmm. um, morality seems to be the most central. Higher cognitive capacities uh, are also very essential. Um, so personality traits, intelligence, um, any sort of like emotional features. Mm -hmm. um, mental traits, which are relatively less uh, important and in, just obviously not in terms of functionality, but in terms of our uh, uh, construction of someone's identity uh, are things like just like these really basic cognitive capacities, like ability to see things or color blindness and things like this. And these, of course, are, are cognitive capacities, but they're not really seen as identity conferring particularly. And in fact, in some of our studies, we found that some of these mental capacities are seen as no more identity conferring than physical traits. Mm -hmm. yeah, it seemed to me in general, in looking at that kind of the different items in your survey and how people reacted, that there's a kind of implicit awareness that anything known to change systematically over the lifespan, we can't call essential to the person, right? I, I mean... Mm -hmm we know that phys their physical capacities are going to change radically. So if there is such a thing as identity, that can't be central to identity, right? Because, um, I mean, you know, I, I, for example, um, uh, something very low on the scale was like uh, liking rock and roll or something, which is kind of interesting in your scale, I mean, but, but people didn't associate that with the core of someone's identity which is kind of interesting because you can see its basis in the stereotype that rock and roll is for young people. But I can tell you as a member of my generation that as it happens, people who liked rock and roll, they continue to like it. It's just that I, the intensity drops, I guess. Um, so well, all passion drops over time. Yeah, yeah passion Bob. does drop. <laughs> um, but although uh, something like sexual interest, intensity of sexual interest was much higher than rock and roll and then homosexual, that was considered, uh, homosexual interest was considered pretty central to identity it, in a way that makes sense, right? People tend not to, to kind of switch back and forth so much, if, if that. Uh, yeah, I mean, one possibility for that is it might be that um, sexual orientation is somewhat moralized in a way that some huh, of these other preferences huh, aren't. They're actually thinking of that as a moral... Yeah, some some people responding would be and some wouldn't be. That's interesting. Right, that's right. Um, okay, so anyway, we have uh, this idea that there is such thing as identity that is persistent. Um, Buddhist philosophy is skeptical of the idea that there is a thing called the self that persists over time. And, um, and and can you talk a little about why your expectation was that this would uh, make Buddhists um, uh, 
less concerned about the prospect of their death than than Hindus and, and Abrahamics, who in your study, I think, were mostly Christians? Yeah. Well, I mean, the reason for our prediction is that this is what the uh, Buddhist texts themselves predict. Um, the Buddhist texts say quite explicitly um, that there's a, at least two reasons that we should cultivate a belief uh, that the self is not constant over time. And there's one, there's a, so the first one is one we've been talking about, which is it, it alleviates the fear of death. So if the Nina of today is no more similar to, uh, you know, herself than the Nina of tomorrow, well, and what does it matter that it doesn't make any sense? When I wake up tomorrow, I'm just as different. So there's nothing for my future self to fear because each moment is sort of a new death. Right. Um, but um, the belief in uh, no constant self over time is also supposed to um, alleviate egocentricity for similar reasons, right? So um, if there's no more similarity between, you know, current Nina than future Nina and current Nina and current Bob, then there's no real reason for me to be, to act in a way that's more generous to my future self than uh, to any other stranger. Mm -hmm. Um and, and I guess as we'll get into, we also found that that doesn't uh, hold up either. Right. So, um, and we should say, by the way, that there are Western philosophers, as you note in the paper, who have arrived at similar uh, kind of Buddhist conclusions, you might say. Mm -hmm. Hume, Derek Parfit, who, who right. died a couple of years ago. Um, the, uh, so, so the first thing you found was that, firstly, yeah. okay, so first of all, let's talk about the specific populations you studied. This wasn't a random sample of Buddhists all over the world, uh, but it was a it was a mainly uh, Tibetans. And right. well, okay. So an important distinction that's relevant to our findings is we studied um, different types of Buddhists and Buddhists who were exposed to different amounts of the doctrine. Mm -hmm. So we um, looked at um, Tibetan Buddhists who were displaced, um, uh, who were both what we call lay Buddhists, right? So they're practicing Buddhists, but they're not part of the monastic order and the monastic uh, Tibetan Buddhists who are in school to, um, to become monks. Mm -hmm. uh, and a third population, which shows up in some of our studies, because you know, when we got our, our results, we were so surprised by them. We thought, well, was there something weird about Tibet? Um, and so we looked at uh, another uh, population of, of, of uh, Buddhists um, in uh, Bhutan, Okay. Um, in addition to this, we looked at Indians who are from uh, the displaced uh, Buddhists in, uh, from Tibet were actually living in this part of India. Okay. Um, and uh, well, there were uh, Hindu Indians as well as Americans. And then we split the Americans into the Christian or Abrahamics, which technically includes uh, uh, Jewish and Islamic populations, although... It's like it, it was something like at least 80 percent of them of these Abrahamics are Christians mm -hmm. and then uh, non-religious or secular uh, Americans. OK. Yeah. Yep. And first you, you found that the, the, the Buddhists did. So well, do you know roughly what was the fraction of the, of the Buddhists who were studying to be monastics? I would think they were more thoroughly steeped in doctrine than the lay Buddhists. Was that a pretty big chunk? Well, I mean, it doesn't affect the the results the, the relative proportions um but i let's just look uh yeah so uh a hundred of them oh no 60 of them are tibetan monastics 60. and then 200 yeah and then 200 okay. of them are lay tibetans i see yep. okay so in any event the, the the buddhists did profess the conception of self that you would expect in other words they they had a they were less inclined to emphasize continuity of identity over time than the Abrahamics and the Hindus. Is that? Well, so we've been uh, making this distinction between uh, the core underlying self and then also the superficial or surface self. Um, uh, Westerners, as, as well as the Indians, uh, had a high amount of agreement with both of those. You know, they thought, well, the, the me of today is not only going to be very similar in terms of you know, its preferences and so forth um, between, you know, a week from today or a year from today or uh, 10 years from today. But so there's not only more agreement on that surface self-measure, but also more agreement on the core self-measure. So just a belief that there is an inner essence that persists over time and is with you for your whole life. 
Mm-hmm. Um, whereas uh, the the Buddhists and, and especially, uh, though not exclusively, but especially those uh, monastic Buddhists said, no way, there's just no similarity. And there's something kind of crazy about these responses. So, I mean, just it, to me, I, I'm surprised by just how um, close to the doctrine the, um, the monastic Buddhists were. So we asked them. A week from today, think about, you know, the music you like to listen to and your personality traits and all these features about yourself. And now think about in a week from today, how connected, how similar is that? The average response they gave was, well, uh, between zero and 100, maybe about 15. 15 in a week? You're going to change that radically? Uh, And, uh, you know, for comparison, Americans said that number is like 90. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, so it's a quite, I mean, and this is in behavioral science research, to find that mm-hmm. large of a difference in populations is, is quite striking. Well, it's interesting because it wasn't really dictated by Buddhist doctrine that they respond that way. The, 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 the core of the Buddhist philosophy isn't that you, that you, in fact, change radically in a short period of time. It's that clearly there are changes, you know, there's a lot of parts of the argument and that... Um, you know, like, for example, I don't think David Hume or Derek Parfit would hinge their arguments on the rate of change or the degree of change, right? It's, it's, it, it, the point is that you're just not the same in a kind of a technical sense from moment to moment. So I'm a little surprised that as a practical, I mean, you're saying that the Buddhists were actually saying, were more inclined to say, yeah, I think my taste in music will have changed in X amount of time or some things like that than the... Yeah, I mean, and they, they, evidently they are using the scale in that way because when we ask them, what about in five years as opposed to a week, zero of the um, monastics said that, you know, they said it was zero. Zero mm-hmm. of them said it was 100 or anything other than zero. They just said there's no connection. So they acknowledged, okay, in a week, maybe there'll be some things that are similar, but five mm-hmm. years, no, nothing at all. Okay, so um, they're, 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 they're professing doctrine according to expectations, basically. Mm-hmm. They, they subscribe to, uh, uh, I mean, if anything, they're exceeding your expectations, I guess, or mine in terms of how, <laughs> how faithful uh, and how widely they apply, um, you know, Buddhist philosophy. Uh, but, um, but then the second part of the expectation that this should make them more equanimous about the prospect of death. And maybe we should talk about that expectation a little more. It's, mm-hmm. it's in a way, I guess, yeah, well, maybe you should, uh, we, we talked, you know, uh, I think in a, in a certain sense, it's a little less straightforward than the expectation that they should um, be more g- generous to people if they really buy the doctrine. But sure. you want to talk more about fear of death and, Right. So we asked about, um, maybe this isn't, this isn't the most direct way of answering your question, but well, we can uh, discuss it. One thing that we asked them kind of as a, a sanity check uh, in the survey is, do you use the belief it, that there's no self over time as a way of coping with the prospect of death? Is that a coping mechanism that you use or that you're aware of using? Because you could imagine that um, people use it at some unconscious level, but they don't really think they're using it. It's not explicit in their mind that they're using it. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, when we ask the populations this question, um, almost 100% of the monastic Tibetans said yes. That is an effective tool that I use. Not just that I should use, right? Mm-hmm. But that I do use when I'm thinking about I'm going to die one day. Mm-hmm. Um, the... Um, uh, the other Tibetans, the other, um, uh, rather, the other Buddhists uh, were sort of uh, halfway there. You know, they said, like, oh, yeah, I, I use it and it's effective. Um, but uh, only, I think, about half of them said that. And now, uh, for the Christians <laughs> in America, zero of them said that. They were like, what are you, ta- what are you talking about? No, so they, they just were complete. This was an alien question to them. None of them checked it off, saying that that was a strategy that they used mm-hmm. to, to combat the fear of death. Yeah, understandably. Um, mm-hmm. So then uh, it turns out that um, Buddhists, first of all, when you uh, ask them questions designed to gauge their generosity, they're not more generous. If anything, less generous along certain they're, dimensions. Is that they're act- 
Well, so I, I want to be very careful in our discussion of this because we just ran one study. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and we should say, and, and, we sh and, and, you know, I mean, speaking of essentialism, I'm not an essentialist when I think about religions, and I think, you know, different, you know, Tibetan Buddhists of a certain, maybe different from Buddhists somewhere, and, you know, sure. Uh, so 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 who knows uh on the other hand it would take a lot of funding to uh do the study it would take to come up with a to ascertain the views of the average buddhist but but anyway with that as a as a caution go ahead uh okay so um maybe i should say a bit about what the actual study was that we did that had to do with um generosity so I was alluding to earlier, um, this, uh, the, the issue really at stake is diachronic identity and making this distinction between your future self, who, if there's no core self, your future self is just as much of a stranger to you as anyone on the street. Mm -hmm. And in principle, that, that, that's what, you know, the case. So, so because of that, if we ask you to make a trade-off between giving your future self extra years of life, versus a, a randomly selected stranger extra years of life mm -hmm. you should be you should say those are the same so there should be no preference if anything uh, i mean i guess if anything you should be more generous towards the stranger but at the very least there should be no difference uh so we gave a participants this option essentially we said okay, imagine that you're sick um and there's a medicine that can prolong your life by um, six months. How much longer would some other stranger need to live? There's only one dose of the medicine before you would say, okay, I'll give my medicine over to them. Mm -hmm. um, so at parity, that's, you know, uh, if you were at parity, you would say, well, six months to six months, you know, that's where I would, you know, because those are the same, essentially. Um, but we, you know, it goes up, you know, nine months, a year, uh, all the way up to five or more years. Um, we found that the Monastic Buddhists, <laughs> something like 75% of them selected, you know, five or more years. And we actually didn't think, to, because we had pre-tested this on American populations and found that most people, most Americans, answer around like two and a half years. Mm -hmm. Okay, if they're getting two and a half years and I'm only getting six months, I guess I'll give them my medicine. But... Um, our skills wasn't sensitive enough actually to measure how egocentric the monastic Buddhists were being because we just, it was five or more years, which, which you could interpret as never, right? Because technically that scale goes up uh, to infinity. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not even clear um, how high they would have gone. Mm -hmm. And our measure almost certainly underestimates uh, the degree of difference, but the Americans, uh, whether Christian or, non-Christian, uh, uh, as well as the Hindu Indians, uh, both were around that kind of two and a half year mark, and at, at which point they said they would switch over. Now, one interpretation of this finding is, well, maybe the monastic Buddhists are just really honest, <laughs> right? Maybe they just really understand that, okay, I know when I was dying that I, you know, I actually wouldn't be able to do this. Maybe. We don't have any reason to think that one group is systematically more honest or dishonest than the other. Mm -hmm. um, another possibility that's been suggested to us, and I think that we discussed in the paper, is that um, maybe it's that monastic Buddhists say, "Well, yeah, okay, like I don't, uh, I don't know who this stranger is. Maybe this stranger is a bad person. Maybe they're not someone who's, you know, going to be able to do as much good as I could do uh, as a." Um, monastic Buddhist. Mm -hmm. I think that that's still kind of, you know, egocentric view of like, you know, I, uh, um, I'm better than other people. I don't think that that's that much more of an optimistic interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, but um, one weakness of this study um, is that uh, we ran out of funding to, to run it on the lay Buddhists. So we don't know where they would be. Uh, um, okay. We've asked for more money, but surprisingly, the the, or, or I guess I should say unsurprisingly, the Buddhist center that was um, cooperating with us is no longer interested in working with us. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, conjectural explanations come to mind. I mean, Christian ethics emphasizes, you know, uh, 
sacrifice, you know, being nice to people who have less and so on. So in, in that sense, that kind of makes, that kind of makes sense. Um, but, I mean, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was going to say is that all religions have methods for coping with fear of death. Mm -hmm. uh, and methods for pro-sociality. Sociali right. um, I mean, that's just sort of baked into at least uh, right. most like, you know, religions, modern religions. Um, so it's not as if uh, Buddhism is alone in having some strategy, right? right. Um, in Christianity, for instance, uh, in Hinduism, there's an afterlife, right? Or, or uh, reincarnation. Yeah. So there's some form of, I mean, and that, what is that but a way of helping you cope with the fear of death. It's just a different means. Yeah. Well, that, I wanted to bring that up because, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, in your paper, you have an explanation for the fact that, uh, I mean, I, and I guess we've already said, basically, the Buddhists in your study feared death more than the, uh, the Americans, mainly Christians, or the Indians, uh, uh, Hindu Indians. Um, the, you, you have an exp uh, a conjectural explanation that makes sense to me, and I want to get back to that, uh, having to do with the fact that these were not necessarily Buddhists who meditate, and we'll get back to that, the, the Buddhists in your study, right? Oh, they meditate, but they might not be expert meditators, Okay, right, with 10,000 sure? hours under their belts. But I would guess that they don't even all meditate. I, I mean... Do it, you, oh, do you mean the monastic Buddhists or the lay Buddhists? I mean both. There are monastic Buddhists who don't meditate. Now, I don't know about the Tibetan tradition in particular, but I've met monastic Buddhists who didn't, didn't meditate every day and didn't, didn't, it just wasn't a, a big thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I wouldn't assume it. And, but in any event, what you say in the, um, paper is that they aren't expert, uh, meditators. Well, let's go ahead and talk about this part before we get to the afterlife. I mean, you know, I've done, um, in the course of uh, researching my book on Buddhist meditation, and for that matter, I mean, I was doing this anyway before I decided to write a book, but I went to some meditation retreats. I have meditation practice, but if you really, um, if you really want to go deeply into the meditative experience, I think most people are well advised to do some out and out silent meditation retreats where you meditate intensively for day after day without talking to anybody or anything. And uh, I had some things that I would say, I wouldn't say I had the full on quote, not self experience, the apprehension that you have no self, that you are no self, but I, I would say I had strong inklings of it. And I would emphasize that they didn't have so much to do with continuity of identity over time. That's an important part of the philosophy of not self is emphasizing uh, that the idea of, of identity uh, being continuous over time doesn't make sense. But there are other parts of the philosophy uh, and other parts of the experience. And they have to do with uh, not identifying with various parts of your experience at any given moment. Okay. So I had experiences on retreat where it honestly felt to me like I had like a tingling in my foot. I heard a bird it felt to me like the tingling in my foot was no more a part of me than the bird that I was, that was singing. Okay. Now that's a, that's a pretty classic variant of a not self experience because the bounds of self are actually dissolving. That's what it seems like. Yeah. Now um, there's two different things going on there. Less identification with parts of you. And, and, and by the way, there's a, th th this, there's a practical uh, in terms of confronting death, th th this, there's a practical manifestation of this, which is that if you're sitting there feeling anxious about death and you meditate in a way that leads you to not identify with your anxiety, and I have had, you know, deep meditative experiences where suddenly my anxiety just didn't seem a part of me and it no longer seemed like a problem. That, of course, solves the problem, at least in the near term, is, is the anxiety about death. Just You just examine it, you look at it, it's there, but it's not part of you. It doesn't. So, so suddenly that particular fear is not tormenting you. But then beyond that, um, just not identifying with the various parts of your experience the way you normally do. I mean, not clinging to them is the way Buddhists would put it, is part of the not self experience. And if you ask me when on retreat, I have been closest to being someone who would say, I don't fear death. 
or closest to being someone who would say, I'd give my left arm to help somebody else. Both of those, I would say, were during that kind of not self experience, mm -hmm. uh, where it's not so much continuity of identity over time. It's like, what are you identifying with right now? You're not mm -hmm. so closely identifying with the parts of yourself. You are, at least you're not identifying with them much more closely than with the other things out there. And just to, to circle back, I, I would say that um, it's this kind of thing, it feels very profound, but it's not the kind of thing that is easy to sustain once you get, yeah, well, for that matter, even once you, go back to your like dorm room at the retreat maybe, but certainly when the retreat is over and you come back and you may be meditating every morning, but it's not going to be that easy to have that uh, depth of experiential skepticism about the self. So this is all a long winded way of saying, I'm not, I'm not surprised if these people were not really intensive meditators that, uh, that they're, their kind of um, intellectual subscription to the idea of not self really didn't help them much when it comes to generosity or death. Because, you know, an interesting thing about Buddhism is that there, on the one hand, are the intellectual justifications for the philosophical doctrines, but there is also the experiential apprehension of them that meditation is thought to facilitate. And my own guess is that the, med the experiential apprehension came first, uh, like that, you know, a couple thousand years ago, whatever, and that the, the philosophical articulation and rationale came later. But in any event, there are these two, uh, these two, two different reasons to believe. And it's the experiential apprehension of the ideas that I think is most powerful and is, and is hardest to sustain, in my experience. Well, um, there's two things that we need to explain in these data, right? One is, why isn't the belief that there's no self helping them uh, fear, fear uh, uh, the death of the self more? Why, why isn't it helping? But then there's a second piece, which is, why is it making them worse? So it's not simply that whatever they're thinking or doing or not doing um, is it helping them compared to these other populations? But it seems to actually be adding to the anxiety, and that's a harder puzzle to answer. See, I, I don't think I. Well, go ahead, but but, but I, I have a conjecture. But go ahead. Uh, okay, I just wanted to add a clarification in the name of uh, precision. Um, we didn't find that because uh, we we measured. You know, there's lots of reasons you could be afraid of death. Right. One is that, you know, yourself won't continue to exist. But there's lots of other reasons, right? Well, what about all the stuff that you want to do? Or what about your, your family missing you after you're gone? Uh, and, and so forth. Uh, and so we measured, you know, lot, uh, we basically gave uh, people a scale. There's lots of different reasons. You know, tell us w which are the reasons and the extent to which you are afraid of them. We did find that the monastic Buddhists were more afraid of death for other reasons. So it's not that they're... We, cause, right, because we're being a little bit a little bit sloppy in this discussion. I just want to make sure that uh, that we represent accurately the results. We don't find that they just, do, you know, fear death more for all of the reasons and all of the ways. It is specifically on the dimension of self annihilation. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid of death because it means the end of myself, mm -hmm. and that's the part that's bizarre. It's not just that they've become more afraid of death because they haven't. And all the other dimensions, they're just like any other person. Um, See, I, I, here's the reason I don't think it's so surprising. The, um, uh, I mean, this is conjectural, but, well, it is and it isn't. The, the um, I mean, again, the intell intellectually subscribing to the idea of not self, in my experience, that has zero power. It has no power. It's, it, it's, it's like you could be, persuaded of the arguments like you could read your david hume and be persuaded but the intuition is so strong the intuition that i am this thing and my interests are to be protected and we don't want this thing to die i mean you wouldn't expect natural selection to create animals that don't have strong intuitive reasons to want to continue living right i mean mm -hmm. and 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 humans uh are certainly no exception. So I'm not, the, the, again, the intellectual, intellectually subscribing to 
I, I don't know. I, I think the intuition that you have a self just kind of carries the day. And but, but Bob, the problem isn't simply that the intellectual view, as you put it, may have no power. Right. It, it seems to actually have a lot of power just in the opposite direction. Well, you're assuming that it's the conception of self that has that power. But there, there are other things that, that distinguish uh, Buddhism from Christianity. Mm-hmm. Christianity guarantees you a, a nice afterlife. Mm-hmm. Buddhism doesn't. Now, I want to emphasize that I think it's misleading to say Buddhism uh, doesn't talk about an afterlife. They do. Yes, they do. They do. They yeah. do. Mm-hmm. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, they... they, they, they um, they the philo- Buddhist philosophers have to like do some fancy footwork to explain what rebirth could mean if the self didn't exist in the first place. I mean, the analogy they use uh, is uh, one analogy that's used is uh, the candle. Yeah, right. the candle. Yeah. Like like there's a candle with a flame, and here's another candle. That's in the next generation. The flame is transmitted to the candle, which actually mm-hmm. makes sense because according to Buddhist philosophy, it is the fire of craving that having not been extinguished in one generation propels the rebirth but um but there is a there there there, um so first there there actually is a conception of an afterlife among uh pretty much all asian buddhists but so but there is not the certainty that christians have there's this there's this and again, I, I, I don't, I'm not an expert on this, but my understanding is that the idea is, look, you do the best you can, and the more virtuous you are, the more likely you are to wind up in, not in some realm of hell, not have some horrible rebirth, but what they don't have is the Christian certainty, and I was brought up Southern Baptist, and I'm telling you, I didn't have any doubt. Because it was a very simple doctrine. You believe that Jesus is your savior and you ask for forgiveness and it doesn't matter how much you sin, you're going to heaven. Buddhists don't have anything remotely like that. And um, I I mean, I would say that if it were the case that they didn't believe in an afterlife, that would be another, I mean, given the fact that intuitively they actually are committed to the idea of self as a practical, like emotional matter matter. They are identifying with the self unless they're meditating like 24 seven. If they did have no conception of the afterlife, I would also expect them to fear death more than Christians. But what they, what they, the version they have has two distinctions uh, with Christianity. One is that they are told that in some technical sense, that won't be them that's reborn. And maybe that carries a little weight and makes them more concerned. But I think the much bigger thing is, um, there isn't. There just isn't the certainty. I mean, that, that's conjecture. But, but well, it is also not totally consistent with our findings because um, the people who are non-religious are no different from the Christians in terms of their their. You mean non-religious of Buddhists? No, uh, non-religious Americans. So these are people who don't yeah. believe in the afterlife. So. Yeah, that. Um, I mean, that's interesting. It. It. Uh, I mean, it, it leads to one other thing I was going to say that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm emphatically not an essentialist when it comes to religion. I don't mm-hmm. think uh, there, I, I think there are almost no meaningful generalizations you can make about the actual ethical conduct of people of different religions. It's very circumstantial. They all have, uh, you know, uh, they all have uh, scriptures that, that counsel being nice to everybody. They all have excuses mm-hmm. you can find in the scripture not to be nice and so on. But I, I would say that, um, you know, somebody could, ta- you know, there are people, social scientists who take very seriously the idea of national character, national, like, for example, self-reliance is, is or was it sometimes supposedly a big American ideal um, and you, and so, you know, I guess you would expect to find certain ideas about the importance of self-reliance in Americans. Um, you could take your data set and instead of saying, what does it say about different religions? Say, what does it say about different nationalities? Right. You could, you could, you could assess it along that dimension. Um, 
Well, except that the monastic Tibetans and the lay Tibetans are the same nationality. And we find those are, you know, where we find differences. Oh, what are the differences you find there? Well, um, the fear of personal death. So the lay Tibetans are no more afraid of self-annihilation uh, than any of the other populations. Oh, they're it's not? Just, no, it's just the monastic Tibetans. So I actually think that the, the, the key critical difference in... You're undoubtedly right that there's many differences, and we haven't mapped out what they are. Mm -hmm. But the most likely suspect here that's kind of lurking in all the data is the uh, degree to which um, the people have been steeped in this ideology. You know, how much of their day do they actually spend really focused on or thinking about whether in a meditating way or not, uh, these ideals? Well, yeah, and in that sense, I mean... Again, if you if you take seriously the idea that the self does not carry over into the next generation, um, I can see it making you fear death more. I mean, again, I think as a matter of actual emotive intuition, almost uh, almost nobody takes the idea of not self seriously, if that makes sense, uh, in the course of a lifetime. But I don't know. I mean, I'd also... I'd also wonder, there's a certain amount of self-selection too, right? These are people who chose to be monastic. It's actually not self Actually, the, it, you'd be surprised. It, it tends to be more kind of culturally prescribed right, by your family. Like, this is what you're doing now. It's not as self-selecty as you'd think. Of course, it's not as, non, as, as, as random as you'd prefer as an experimental right, psychologist. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not as if, you know, these are people who just ha felt a calling and so went and did it. That's a very yeah. kind of American idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I would still, yeah, you're right. It, it, it would, I mean, it would be nice to, I mean, it's still for statistical purposes, self-selection. And I mean, I mean uh, it's not totally random. It's not random. Um, so have you thought about, uh, it would be hard because you'd have to gauge have a measurement of intensity of meditation. But have you thought about um, trying to look at people who are really super intensive uh, yes. meditators? We wrote a grant about it, in fact. <laughs> a grant that was not funded. Uh, but that is what we would, one of the things we'd like to look at next is, okay, okay well, what's the role of meditation in all of this, if anything? You know, maybe it's mm. just that the Buddhists that we looked at, you know, they just haven't, gotten there yet they haven't gotten over the hump yeah what we suggest in the paper as for an explanation and this is completely provisional particularly because it, we weren't expecting to find this so it's we might even call it post hoc if you're being ungenerous although that's also what it is <laughs> it, it is that it might be that there's something about spending a lot of time thinking about a concept that very few of us find intuitive you know, as human beings, that makes us cling even more strongly to the view, right? So I'm not going around thinking about, well, my self might be extinguished tomorrow because it's just not part of my you know, daily mental life. But if I were in a monastic order uh, in Tibet, I might be thinking about it all the time. Uh, and then it will really become this kind of like focal point of anxiety and am I doing it well enough? And and I, I have to extinguish this idea that myself exists. And, yeah. and it might just be that, right? And then you just kind of cling to it even more strongly. Well, that's kind of what I mean. It's like, I guess I would say, um, not only is it the experiential apprehension of not self that I would expect to have the consoling power. Mm -hmm. the, the merely intellectual uh apprehension of not self with no experiential component or little i would expect to be kind of scary i mm -hmm. mean i i mean you know that's the way western clinicians would expect it right you need to have a strong sense of identity to be a psychologically healthy person and if you start doubting that it doesn't feel good so yeah. that kind of makes sense to me um mm -hmm. But it's there should be somebody who would fund your study. I'm trying to think. I mean, I mean, it, I, I'm wondering were you, were you imagining? Because you know there are also now somewhat objective criteria for determining the meditative depth in a certain sense. You know, these adept meditators apparently can go in to uh, get into their little MRI machine and very quickly 
bring the default mode network, you know, as you know, yeah. part of your brain that's active when your mind is wandering to, to a, a, a level of extreme calm. So there are ways of, um, you know, other than self-report, other, other than asking people how long they meditate to gauge at least one dimension of meditative prowess. Right. So we could put them in the scanner uh, and ascertain that they were in a meditative state. That study would, of course, be much more expensive yeah. and it'd add at least a zero to the end of that grant proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, I actually don't think it's what, what's much more important for our purposes if we were actually looking at experts, uh, expert meditators would be to uh, seek out the ones who've had the practice. Mm -hmm. right? 10,000 hours or whatever you want to put the bar at. Um, and I would also personally be interested in looking at um, Asian Buddhists and, you know, white boy Buddhists. I don't know if that's a technical term, but, um, that's, right, yes, but that's, Western. That's in the literature, white boy Buddhists. I, that's how I, I think of them informally. Um, right. But, but there might be some systematic differences there as well. Well, I mean, the irony is that that uh, the white boy Buddhists are a lot more likely to meditate. I, I mean, there's this misconception in America that Buddhists are people who meditate and don't believe in God. <clears throat> Wrong. They believe right. in gods. Uh, they believe mm -hmm. in divinities. Mm -hmm. They believe in an afterlife. Uh, the Asian Buddhists uh, very rarely are people who meditate, certainly at the lay level. Uh, many monks don't meditate um, and with any regularity. Uh, so actually it's the, uh, I mean, ironically, the, the, uh, maybe the most robust, uh, meditators would tend to be the white boys. Um, so yeah, so, but, but right now you're not going anywhere else with this particular study. Oh no, well, uh, we, <laughs> it might, the study might, uh, or, or series of studies, the project might get funded at some point. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, we have written grant proposals for it that have, uh, not not yet been funded. Now, did you see the same difference between lay and monastic Buddhists on the generosity? Um, unfor unfortunately, that was one oh, where that, we didn't, didn't have the, the comparison I'm, class. Okay. Would have been awesome to have. Yeah. Um, and and like for me personally, because my I when I work on identity, but I'm also much of my work is, concerns moral cognition. So I would love to dig deeper into that. Yeah. We have just the one study but um with more funding that's like the first thing that that i i would want to look at yeah part of the thing may just be that monasticism is not good for the average person for the um, the psychological well-being of the average person now, now speaking of psychological well-being you are i gather now uh, work are you working on some happiness stuff or like what um yes uh, does this relate, is this, are you relating any of this stuff to that or, or the leave aside Buddhism, just sense of self and, and happiness? Yes. Um, it's, it, well, actually, yeah. Um, we have, uh, with, uh, Josh Nob, uh, who's a professor at Yale. Um, we have some funding, we've run studies on the concept of happiness. So this is, you know, a little bit different than, you know, actual like, well-being. And so I think to many people, maybe less interesting and no less interesting to me personally. But how do we understand what it takes to be happy? What mm -hmm. makes someone happy, regardless of whether that's true or not? It turns out that most of us believe that happiness is not just a matter of feeling good all the time, right? So maximizing hedonic states, um, but rather uh, to be truly happy, um, you need to also be good in some way. Um, and so we've uh, run a bunch of studies showing that it's not just about, you know, flourishing or, um, you know, uh, achieving um, what the Greeks call erete or, or greatness or excellence, uh, through any means, uh, right? So, you know, you might think of it as you could develop some athletic skills or artistic skills or intellectual skills, but people especially say that in order to uh, be happy, you need to be morally good, right? Mm -hmm. So some party girl who does drugs all the time uh, and uh, it generally lives a dissolute life, people say, well, you know, she's not really happy. She might think that she's happy, but deep down she isn't. Now, this is no bearing on whether she's actually happy, 
right, in any kind of clinical sense. And nonetheless, most of us have this intuition that in order to be truly happy, you need to uh, have these um, moral uh, events and actually live a kind of morally good lifestyle, which is very closely aligned with the stoic view of happiness, which is actually that the hedonics are irrelevant. You just need to be an upstanding citizen. Um, and uh, some of the data that we've been collecting shows that this isn't just in America. It's not just Americans who have this uh, view, um, but we've uh, looked at um, people living in China and they show basically the exact same pattern, right? The people who are the happiest uh, are the ones who are leading a morally good life. Now, um, now you're saying that is the perception. In other perception. words, they say that if that person's not leading a morally good life, they're not happy. It's not, it isn't the finding that if they're not in some objective sense, if there were such a thing, leading a morally good life, um, they're, they're not happy. That's, that's, not that's right. right. So this is about uh, the concept of happiness. That being said, uh, you know, there are some interesting ironies here, which is um, because if you wanted to connect it up with what does it actually mean to be happy, um, people who lack um, moral capacities, uh, such as psychopaths, Mm. <laughs> or I should say psychopaths, um, have almost no uh, clinical overlapping with depression. Um, so if you score high in psychopathy, you probably don't have to worry about being depressed ever. Um, so at least for this subpopulation, um, you're probably not going to be unhappy if you live this kind of um, morally bereft life. That being said, set, as set aside the psychopaths, it might nonetheless be the case that for the average person, it would sort of slowly make us miserable to not only be bad, but perhaps especially to believe that we were bad uh -huh. um, and that that would make us miserable. But that's a sort of kind of uh, the next uh, the next step or uh, the next frontier in this research. Okay. Yeah. About how people conceive of what it takes to be um, to be happy. Right. So you could view that, you know, we have this concept of happiness. There's two possibilities. One is that it's right and one is that it's wrong. So we might just have this concept that's completely inaccurate. We have, it's a delusion that we have for whatever reason. Maybe it, it helps us, you know, believe that the, the world is fair or something like that. Um, but it's also possible that the concept is, in, at least in some way, veridical, right? It simply is the case that people are more likely to be happy if they're leading a morally good life, regardless of how much pleasure they're feeling. Mm -hmm. It could, you're saying it could be the case. It could be the case. Is, is there not, I guess data would be inherently hard to come by on that. There must be people who have views in psychology. Yeah, there is some data on this. It's not, you know, it is sort of, it doesn't paint a very solid picture, mm -hmm. but data on the, the relationship uh, between uh, character virtues and well-being. So... Uh, you know, is, and then is it suggest? Is it suggest it's suggestive that, that it's virtue su is conducive to happiness? I would describe it as somewhere between suggestive and mixed. So uh -huh. it might depend on how you measure. Again, it might also depend if you partial out the psychopaths who are uh -huh. going to feel great being horrible. Yeah, yeah, I would guess so. Um, okay, any other tips on how to be happy? Um, I don't believe I've given any tips on how to be happy. <laughs> no, you haven't, actually. Uh, I mean, there's a hint of one if there's a correlation between, uh, a sometimes found correlation between uh, virtues and happiness. I would think it might be easier to study the correlation between just, you could come up with an operational de uh, definition of hedonism, right? Like how, mm -hmm. to what extent people indulge for the sake of short-term gratification and whether that's conducive to overarching happiness but that's a little different though right so yeah than just how much pleasure are you feeling versus are you seeking out short-term rewards versus mm -hmm. long-term rewards but i mean b both could be contributing to happiness and you haven't done any studies of stoics i guess you mentioned that there's, there's a growing population of stoics you know stoicism is. i did not know that oh yeah it's it's kind of coming back i mean um like massimo puli Piliucci, P I G L I, etc. Philosopher mm -hmm. who's been on uh, my podcast a couple of times is is has written a book about it. There's um another. There's a daily Stoic newsletter. No, it's more. It's it's a little bit of a happening thing. And they uh, Stoics have a lot in common philosophically with Buddhists. Not yes. I don't I don't mean necessarily on the self front, self conception front, but um. But on like desire is suffering, you know that kind of front. Yeah, and on the idea that 
if you play your cards right, your happiness doesn't have to bear any correlation to the circumstances you find yourself in. Mm-hmm. Right. But it sounds like one takeaway from your work is maybe one of the circumstances you should try not to find yourself in is being in a monastery. Because at least in your study, <laughs> they, were, they were most afraid of death and, the le- and least generous, uh, or at least right. in the thought experiments, least generous. Personally, there was no risk of me ever joining a monastery. Um, but for anyone else who's considering it, it doesn't seem like at least a Buddhist uh, monasteries uh, help you uh, combat a uh, fear of self annihilation or become more generous. And if you do, if you do try to find one, maybe some country other than Tibet. Well, so um, well, thank you for taking the time. Um, I'm going to keep meditating, but uh, <laughs> I'll see. I'll start. Th- I'll start meditating on death and see if it uh, has much bearing one way or the other. I- I'm just. I'm not enthusiastic about death, never have been, but... Well, you might, why don't you try meditating with thinking about, you know, myself really exists and it's constant and it's always going to be there and see how far that gets you. Well, according to Buddhism, mindfulness meditation would inherently be conducive. Good mindfulness meditation would inherently be conducive to the opposite intuition, mm. but maybe if I, if I put enough effort into it, Dang. I can become a... Uh, uh, radical Buddhist. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Anything else? Oh, where can we find your stuff? I know you have a website, uh, your name.com, right? Yes. Uh, Are you on Twitter? I am on the Twitter, uh, at Nina Strominger. Okay. And I am mm-hmm. at Robert Ryder, by the way, W-R-I-G-H-T-E-R. And where uh, uh, these papers, all these relevant papers, helpfully, can be found as PDFs on your website. Mm-hmm. Anything else you want to steer us toward? Uh, no, I've steered everyone away from the monasteries. I think that <laughs> my work here is done. You're doing God's work. <laughs> as it were, yeah. As a Christian would say, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Nina. Thanks, Bob. Bye-bye.